The film begins with a group of slaves learning how to cut sugar cane. A man sits languidly atop a wagon of raw cane root, idly watching the men's labor. The setting shifts to a cluster of shacks. The slaves are consuming food. Solomon Northup is inspired to create ink and a quill after noticing the dark juice of blackberries. Regrettably, the scheme fails. The juice is too watery. Later in the slave quarters, a female stirs in her sleep and sexually advances on Northup, using his hand for release. The title card flashes as Solomon recalls happier times with his wife and children. We get glimpses into Solomon's life as a free man. He is a talented violinist who is in high demand in his hometown of Saratoga. Later that night, after putting the kids to bed, he talks with his wife, who will soon take the kids with her to work as a cook. He mockingly expresses his resentment at being deprived of her cooking. He sees them off in a carriage the next morning. Later that afternoon, he meets a friend who introduces him to two travelers, Brown and Hamilton, who claim to work for a circus-style show. They offer him a large sum of money to accompany them to Washington, D.C., and promise his return before his wife returns. He agrees to accompany them. The trio is next seen in a restaurant in Washington, D.C. His clients deposit a bag of coins in excess of the agreed-upon amount. They share wine, and one of them keeps a close eye on Solomon as he empties his glass. Everyone is having a wonderful time. Solomon wakes up in a dank cell, chained to the floor. In a series of flashbacks, we see his friends carry him up to his hotel room, apologizing to other guests for his drunken stupor. Brown tells Hamilton that time is running out and that they need to get this over with. The flashback concludes with their departure and we rejoin Solomon in the cell, where he is informed that he is a runaway Georgia slave. He has no papers, despite his protests of being a free man. Solomon is beaten mercilessly and eventually thrown into a slave pen with others. He discusses his predicament with Clemens, an apparently educated slave who advises him on the gravity of their situation. Soon after, a mother, Eliza, and her daughter are brought to the pen to join a captured son. She tries to keep a brave face while realizing the impending tragedy. They are dragged from their cell, chained, and transported to a riverboat under the cover of darkness. They are led to the hold, which is already crammed with other human cargo. Clemens reiterates his recommendation that Solomon keep a low profile and deny his ability to read and write. They come across another slave, Robert, who wishes to revolt and seize control of the ship. They weigh their options before deciding to be cautious. Later that night, a slaver arrives at the hold and wakes Eliza in order to rape her. Robert tries to intervene in the rape but is stabbed and killed. Clemens and Solomon are accused of disposing of the body in the river, prompting Clemens to remark that Robert is better off dead. They eventually arrive at a dock. Clemens's master is waiting for them and demands the return of his stolen property right away. Clemens gratefully scampers down into his master's embrace, abandoning all evidence of his previously demonstrated intellect. Solomon's only friend has died. A slaver, ironically named Freeman, calls his new property to their feet after disembarking by announcing their names. He addresses Solomon as Platt, which he clearly does not recognize. Solomon receives a slap for denying the name. The humiliation of Freeman's slave operation is demonstrated by naked slaves bathing in buckets at his offices. Inside, he delivers his sales pitch to eager customers. A wealthy plantation owner, Ford, expresses an interest in Platt and Eliza. She begs him to take her children as well, but Freeman refuses and quickly sells her son to another buyer. Ford tries to buy her daughter, clearly of mixed ancestry, but Freeman refuses to lower his price. Ford can only afford two of them. Eliza is distraught and screams angrily, disrupting the sale. To lighten the mood, Solomon is instructed to play the fiddle. Ford returns his purchases to his plantation. Eliza has been sobbing the entire journey. Ford's wife says that food and a good night's sleep will help her forget about them. The slaves are introduced to Tabitz, a slave handler, and Ford's overseer, Chapin, the following morning. As the slaves work, Tabitz sings a mocking song warning them not to flee. They keep chopping wood until they come across a small band of native people with whom they share a brief respite. Solomon notices a stringed instrument and recalls his own violin. The next day, Solomon approaches Ford with a novel idea to transport the lumber via the river against Clemens's advice. 
To Beats is extremely patronizing, but Ford is persuaded by Solomon's opinions. To Beats is humiliated as the scheme succeeds. As a reward, Ford gives Solomon a violin to play. Back at the slave quarters, Eliza weeps over the loss of her children. Solomon is irritated by the noise and debates with her about surviving Ford's decent treatment. Eliza responds that Ford must know Solomon is not a slave, yet he does nothing to free him. Solomon is taken aback. Eliza is eventually sold because Ford's wife is unable to bear the noise. Tabitz attempts petty vengeance on Solomon over the next few days, resulting in a verbal confrontation. Tabitz tries to beat Solomon, who fights back and defeats him. Chapin arrives on the scene and sends Tabitz fleeing. He warns him that if he runs, he will be unable to protect him, and hints that he will have Ford straighten it out. Later, we discover that Tabitz has gathered a gang of thugs to lynch Solomon for daring to oppose him. When Chapin returns with guns drawn, they have the noose around his neck and are preparing to hang him. He chases them away, but Solomon remains on tiptoes, barely able to support his weight. Punishment for striking a white man. Slaves emerge from their cabins one by one, seemingly unconcerned about his plight. A woman stealthily brings him some water before fleeing. After what appears to be hours, Ford returns and cuts the rope, saving Solomon. He drags him into the house for protection, but eventually decides he must be sold. Tabitz will not be deterred from exacting his vengeance. We learn here that Ford sold Solomon to a notorious plantation owner named Epps, who is known for brutal beatings. Epps reads from the Bible, slanting the text to reinforce his ownership of the slaves. The following day will be spent picking cotton. The weight of each worker's bundles is marked at the end of the day. Solomon's yield is below average. Slaves who pick less than the previous day are punished with lashes. Meanwhile, Patsy's output nearly doubles that of the best worker. Epps circles Patsy and lavishes her with compliments. He is clearly taken with her, and his wife is not pleased. Epps enters the slave quarters and awakens them, resulting in an impromptu dance in which Patsy is the center of attention. Patsy is brutally scarred when Epps' wife throws a heavy crystal decanter at her face. She demands that Epps sell Patsy, but he says he would rather send his wife away than lose Patsy. Mistress Epps dispatches Solomon on a shopping trip. She gives him a list and observes him reading it. She emphasizes that he should not do it again. Solomon is inspired to flee on his way to the store, but he stumbles into a lynching. His spirit is broken after witnessing the fate of the two men, but he continues to the store. Seeing the paper, he decides to bring a spare sheet with him every time so that he can write a letter. Epps sends Solomon to a nearby plantation owned by Shaw some time later. Shaw married one of his slaves, elevating her status, at least on his plantation. Patsy is there to enjoy the finery but Epps is apparently jealous that Shaw might try to better. Solomon persuades Patsy to join him after a brief break. When they return to Epps' plantation, he is clearly inebriated. Solomon suggests to Patsy that she avoid Epps, which Epps interprets as a sexual advance. Mistress Epps intervenes after a drunken chase around the yard, if only to express her disgust at her husband's obsession with Patsy. Epps stumbles to the slave quarters later that night and rapes her. Mistress Epps has had enough of her husband's affair and harshly slashes Patsy's face. Patsy later begs Solomon to strangle her and dispose of her body. She can no longer bear the weight of Epps's rapes and his wife's anguish. Despite her entreaties, Solomon refuses. We learn later that Epps's cotton crops have been destroyed by insects. Two crops have been lost. So he decides to lend his slaves to a judge who can use them and pay off the mortgage on their purchase. This brings us back to the beginning, where Solomon is cutting sugarcane. The judge notices Solomon's talent and refers him to a neighbor in need of music for a party. As an added bonus, the judge says Solomon is free to keep any wages he earns. The party is fancy dressed and Solomon clearly sees parallels between his former life as a free man and his forced servitude. The party has come to an end, and it's time to head back to Epps' farm. Patsy's bloody eye indicates that her torments have not ended as Solomon approaches the house. The cotton crop has arrived, which means it's time to return to the fields. This time, they are joined by a white laborer, Armsby, who is picking in order to earn money and get back on his feet. Despite producing far less than any other worker, he is spared the whipping that all other slaves receive. 
He tends to Solomon's wounds and tells his story in the quarters. He appears to be a decent individual with a sympathetic ear. Solomon decides to put his trust in him by sending a letter north in the hopes of gaining his freedom. He gives Armsby his entire party earnings and swears him to secrecy. He will have the letter delivered to him in two days. Solomon begins by making ink and writing the letter. Epps enters the quarters and walks Solomon outside that night. Armsby broke his promise and told Epps everything. Fortunately, he told Solomon his story before he received the letter. He quickly flips the story on Armsby, branding him a liar who is seeking favor in order to get a job, and plays on Epps' low opinion of slaves. This story convinces Epps, and Solomon is saved. Later, Solomon burns the letter, watching his hopes for freedom burn away in the ashes. Sometime later, we come across a group of workers constructing a structure with the help of a hired hand, Bass. Bass is from the North and has strong opinions that contradict Epps's staunch support for slavery. They converse in front of Solomon, piquing his interest. Later, Epps is all worked up about Patsy. She's gone missing, and Epps believes she's fled. He threatens all the women with violence because of her loss, but she has only returned to Shaw's plantation to see a friend. She tries to persuade Epps that she is faithful to him by going to get some soap, a luxury that Epps's wife has denied her. She asserts her worth and insists that she is deserving of being clean. Epps is pushed over the edge by his wife's bickering and orders Patsy to be whipped. He finds himself unable to inflict the punishment as he prepares to strike. Cravenly, he insisted on Solomon doing it. Solomon tries to be gentle at first, but Mistress Epps sees through the deception and nudges her husband to be harsher. Epps holds a gun to Solomon's head and threatens to kill every slave he sees if Patsy isn't whipped harder. Faced with an unfathomable choice, he whips her harder, a pink mist of blood trailing behind each new strike. After a brief pause, Epps charges forward, enraged, and whips Patsy himself. Her flesh is ripped to shreds by the brutal punishment, and she collapses. Solomon is left alone with the hired hand, Bass. He inquires as to where he is from, and when Bass responds, Canada, Solomon demonstrates convincing knowledge of the country. Solomon explains his dire situation when Bass asks how he's so well-traveled. Bass comes to believe Solomon's story and recognizes the terrible injustice. As they continue to work, Solomon takes a risk and asks Bass to write letters to his Saratoga friends. Bass concurs. The work is then completed, and he departs. Solomon is haunted by a long shot. He has no idea if Bass kept his word. We don't know how long Bass has been gone, but the tears in Solomon's eyes suggest that he is beginning to believe he has been betrayed once more. A group of men is now tilling the soil and planting seeds. When a carriage arrives at the Epps plantation, an official-looking man calls out for Platt, Solomon. He responds and walks up to the man, a sheriff. The man questions him and motions to another man in the carriage. It's Mr. Parker, a Saratoga shop owner and Solomon's friend. The sheriff is persuaded with little further prodding, and Solomon rushes to embrace his friend. Epps is enraged and yells threats. The sheriff refutes the arguments, and Parker assists Solomon in getting into the carriage that will transport him to safety. Patsy approaches and calls out to him. Solomon leaps from the carriage to give her one last embrace before departing. Patsy collapses in tears as he walks away. Solomon has now been returned home. Outside his door, he appears overcome with joy at being free of his nightmare. He sees his family as he walks in. They are 12 years older, but they are still taken aback when they see him. Solomon Northam is the name of his daughter's son, whom she married. Tears well up in their eyes as they gather around him to welcome him home. A series of title cards explain that he attempted, but failed, to sue his kidnappers. Northup became an abolitionist and helped many runaways gain freedom.